talk today about sleep on the HCG diet. I also wanted to let you guys know that um, my HCG diet workbook is now available on Amazon. So you can find it just by going to amazon.com and all you have to do is search HCG diet HCG Chica and the workbook will pop right up for you guys. Um, I also have a, um, a video tutorial showing you guys the workbook and like the inside of it because I'm a very visual person and I need to see the inside of stuff and what it looks like to see if it's gonna be useful for me. So I've done that for you guys. I'll link to that in the blog post. So you guys can definitely check that out. But now let's go on and, and get started on today's topic which is all about sleep on HCG. And, um, you know, some sleep very well on HCG, which if that's you, congratulations, good for you. <laughs> but a lot of us end up having trouble and it doesn't end up always being every round. Some rounds you might sleep fine, but then you might have a round or two where you're just having fitful sleep. So we'll talk about um, the reasons behind why you could be having trouble sleeping and also solutions for, um, for those causes. Um, also, we're gonna talk about why sleep is so important on HCG. Um, I'm also one of those people that tends to put off sleep. I like to keep doing things and accomplishing things in like five more minutes, 10 more minutes, and um, I just fight sleep, you know? So this was eye-opening even for me and helped remind me of how important sleep is, but especially, sleep in general of course is important, but especially in relation to weight loss. I'm gonna be sharing a study with you guys showing how very connected they are um, and how much it can affect um, the results that you have. There might be other times when you can burn the midnight oil and, and get away with it. We're all gonna do that. But when you're designating this time on HCG to lose weight, um, I wanna bring up this little scientific study now that shows why sleeping on HCG is so important. All right, so this study, which I'll link to the study in the blog post that goes with this video, so you can go check that out for yourself if you want to. It was done in 2010. It was a small pilot study, but um, it was a two-week period of time where both groups that were being tested were on the exact same diet, and the diet was aimed at weight loss. So I can't remember the exact calorie intake, but it was the exact same diet. That was no different. Now, the interesting thing is the outcome of their results while their weight loss was about the same in both groups, the ratio of muscle loss and fat loss in each group was completely different. And the reason for that is because of the factor that they were testing, which is sleep. One of the groups was sleeping only five and a half hours a night for that two week period. The other group was sleeping a full eight and a half hours every night. Now remember, their diet was exactly the same. Their weight loss on the scale was also almost exactly the same. However, they did, um, I think it was actually DEXA scan, which is an extremely accurate way to test body fat percent. And that's where the big difference came in, where they saw the results of this different ratio of fat loss to muscle loss. So I'm just gonna read you um, the weight loss and sleep study summary. It says the volunteers lost an average of 6.6 .6 pounds during each 14 day session. Okay, so both of them lost about six and a half pounds, both groups. During weeks with adequate sleep, they lost 3.1 pounds of fat and 3.3 pounds of fat-free body mass, mostly protein. So what that means is those who were getting enough sleep were losing 50% fat and 50% muscle, essentially. Which isn't really that good even at that, and that's because they weren't using HCG. We know that um, from my results anyway, I believe HCG does spare your muscle far more than that. <laughs> and I'll actually, you know, I'll link you guys to some of my body fat testing to show you the percentage of fat loss I've had. I've had up to like 90% fat loss um, of my weight loss on an HCG round. Okay, so half of it was fat, half was muscle. During the short sleep weeks, so on the weeks that they only had five and a half hours of sleep, it says participants lost an average of 1.3 pounds of fat and 5.3 pounds of fat-free mass. So you guys should have done the, um, the numbers as far as the, per the percentages, but that's like a little over a pound of fat and a little over five pounds of muscle when they were not getting enough sleep. Can you imagine that? Only, so you lose 
over six pounds, but only a little over a pound of that is fat. The rest was muscle. And this was in the group that had their sleep deprived so that they were only sleeping five and a half hours a night. And you might think like, you know, oh, if you go to bed at midnight and you wake up at 5.30, a lot of people probably do that, right? Um, and even on ECG, you know, and, and it may be hard to get enough sleep, but I thought that this was just so eye-opening um, because you, muscles basically, muscles not something you ever, it's never advantageous to lose muscle, right? It's not gonna benefit you in any way. Having muscle is very important to your strength, to your metabolism. The more muscle you have, the more you can eat, um, and all of that, right? Muscle is just a good thing. It's the fat, we don't. We do need some fat, as of course, as well, but we don't need nearly as much as most of us have started out with, right? So I thought that that was really interesting. I also have linked you guys in the blog post to a video that kind of gives you a little synopsis of the study as well. I found very interesting. And so I actually paid to download the details of this study. I think it was like $40 for me to actually access, not just the synopsis, but to see the full study, how they carried it out, um, because I wanted to make sure that they were actually you know, gauging these results with accurate measurements. And they did use DEXA scan um, to do this. So, so we know that the numbers that they got are accurate. So I found this really fascinating. And again, even though it was like a small group of people, I can't remember, maybe like a dozen or something like that. Um, I still think, to me, it's, it's good evidence that sleep is a huge important part of the process when it comes to what exactly your body ends up utilizing for fuel. And um, of course, I do think HCG does have a muscle sparing effect, which I mentioned, but this, this issue of sleep could really play a role in how much of your weight loss ends up being fat versus muscle. And again, if you were to lose a lot of muscle on a round, it's also gonna make it harder both to stabilize and to maintain your weight because your body's gonna wanna get that muscle back if it's, because basically for, for all of us, we're gonna have, we all have a certain height and we have like a bone you know, like if we're small boned or medium boned or large boned, we have a different frame sizes, right? So based on your frame size and your height, and if you're male or female, you're going to have a general, like a range of muscle mass that most people in that category have. This is also affected by ethnicity as well. Um, so that can be a factor that affects it. But basically, depending on those factors, you're, there's a certain amount of muscle that is going to be considered healthy by your body that your body is going to want to have is basically how I'm looking at it. And so if you were to lose a lot of muscle on any weight loss program, when it concludes, it makes sense to me anyway that your body's going to naturally want to get that muscle back as quickly as possible because now your body has less than it really should have in order to you know, do all the things that you need to do in daily life and, and take care of your body. So that's that's kind of my take on that and, and just showing um, how significant this is. Now, additionally, fat does take up more space on your body than muscle does. I don't think it's actually a huge amount more. I've, actually, I've seen those images um, online showing like five pounds of fat and five pounds of muscle. And after I looked into it a little more, I think they're a little misconstrued. Um, so I don't think that muscle necessarily takes up that much less space than fat, but it is less. And also it looks different. So for instance, my legs are actually still pretty stocky. Um, like if I wear certain pants, I could still look chubby, I suppose, but when I wear shorts or whatnot, um, muscle has a very different look, even when it's thicker than fat does. Fat is dimply and rump, you know, rumply. <laughs> is that a word? Uh, yeah, it's just it's just cheesy, cottage cheesy, right? And muscle doesn't look at all like that. It's very smooth. It has these curves to it. it it's just very. I don't know if the word buoyant. That's probably not the right word, but but you know what I mean. So so it also looks very different on your body. So just to clarify again, what this study was showing is that those who um, slept enough every night, eight and a half hours, they lost 50% more of their weight as fat. So that is very significant. And um, just to put it in perspective, I tried to think of a little example. Say there was two twins, 
let's see, how did I write my example here? Two twins that had, say, the same starting weight, um, and they both lost 20 pounds with HCG. Now, this is just an example of potential because we don't know exactly how many pounds equate to how many dress sizes lost. I mean, it's gonna depend on your body shape and your height and all of that. But say two twins weighed the same, they lost 20 pounds with the HCG diet, but one twin slept five and a half hours a night, one twin slept eight and a half hours a night. The potential is given the amount of muscle loss that one will experience and the higher fat loss that the person, the twin sleeping more will have, their sizes, even though they lost the same amount of weight, they have the same body, um, there's the potential that the twin who slept enough could be like a size six after losing their 20 pounds and the twin who didn't sleep enough could be maybe a size eight, 10 because not as much of their weight loss was fat. So again, just very, very interesting. I find, I find this really fascinating. So sorry if this isn't as interesting to you. I just, I think it's, I, when, I fa when I came across this study, I was just like, wow, this is, this is mind boggling, you know? So, um, and like I said, I do tend to fight sleep. I do, um, even right now, it's like 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was fasting today too. And, and I'm like, oh man, I need to eat some protein because <laughs> otherwise what's gonna happen? So um, anyway, so just take that into consideration as realizing that sleep is very important to this process and that while HCG does appear to have a muscle sparing effect, in my opinion, um, I still think that that can play a role. And it, honestly, it makes sense to me anyway because when you go to sleep, that's when your your body turns on in a sense, right? That's they say when your brain um, solidifies memories. It's it's when your your body heals because during the day you're busy doing stuff, right? You're digesting, you're you're thinking, you're carrying out all kinds of activities. So it's not really the right time for your body to be healing and cleaning up and taking care of things. So it's like when you go to bed, that's when all that stuff starts happening. And if you don't allow enough time for that to be going on obviously not as much as gonna get done, right? Or it's not gonna happen in, in as good a way is kind of how it seems like. I wanna talk next about how being awake more hours of the day equates to more hunger as well. Um, and that same article that I referenced um, that we just talked about had this to say about sleeping less. It said, when sleep was restricted, dieters produced higher levels of ghrelin a hormone that triggers hunger and reduces energy expenditure. And you can learn about how um, more about how that hormone, um, ghrelin, affects you um, with a link that I posted in the blog post below. And I'm just gonna read this next part because I can't seem to remember it to say it correctly. <laughs> um, but additionally, another study was done, which I have linked to in the blog post, showing that less sleep equated with lower leptin levels, which lower leptin means more hunger, another hormone, and higher ghrelin levels, a hormone that causes um, those growling hun hunger sensations. Um, so if you have more of that hormone, you're gonna have more perceived hunger. Of note in this study as well is, is the type of food that they felt compelled to eat when they were in this state of having lower leptin levels and higher ghrelin levels, making them feel more hungry because they hadn't slept enough. Um, it says that they had a craving especially for calorie dense foods with high carbohydrate content. Um, so of course that's the exact opposite of what we're allowed to do on the HCG protocol. Um, so that would obviously you know, present a tremendously challenging problem mentally you know, if that was going on. And in fact, that is actually what a lot of us deal with daily, right? And sometimes we not, may not be aware of why we're struggling so bad. And it is true that sometimes when your HCG dosage is off, that can be a cause. But this is another factor. If you're not sleeping enough and you're awake, you're just awake more hours of the day, it, it's gonna cause more hunger regardless of your dosage. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever done this. There's been rare occasions where I would wake up at like three in the morning and I, I couldn't go back to sleep. So I'd you know grab my iPad and go sit on the couch and I'd be awake you know, from like three to five researching on my iPad, but I would find that during that time, I would get so hungry that I would literally feel sick to my stomach, like just nauseous and sick. Um, my stomach would be kind of grumbling. And um, 
I, I just think it's funny because of course when I'm asleep, I don't feel that way, right? So usually three to five in the morning, I'm asleep and I'm not hungry. Um, but being awake, I was hungry and I felt like I have to eat something or I'm just gonna keep feeling horribly sick. So it is very interesting. So it's just some food for thought there as well. Okay, so now that we know why sleeping is so important, <laughs> um, which remember the main things are you could lose more muscle if you don't sleep enough and you will just <clears throat> feel more hungry because you're awake more hours of the day, um, which means that you may be more tempted to give in and cheat and the diet will just, it, it can feel a lot harder because you're, you're eating very little. So those two things, why it's important. So now we're gonna talk about um, but like I said, many of you want to sleep and you're just having problems sleeping. You're like, yes, I'd like to, so how do I do that? So let's talk about some main reasons why we can experience trouble with sleeping on HCG. Now, one of the main reasons that it can be troublesome is because cortisol, the hormone cortisol, which comes from your adrenals, can be elevated when you're on this diet. And um, just to clarify, Cortisol is often elevated on any diet. And you know, it kind of makes sense because any diet technically is a stress to your body. It's requiring your body to, to do more than usual, right? So from what I researched online, it's very common to have elevated cortisol levels when you're on a diet. Now, when you have a healthy cortisol pattern, typically cortisol is highest in the morning because that's when you need to wake up and, and be alert and get stuff accomplished. And then the cortisol levels are supposed to gradually fall throughout the day so that by the nighttime, it's gonna be at the lowest level, which is good, what's gonna allow you to head off to slumber and dreamy sleep. Um, and that's when your cortisol levels should be the lowest. However, when on a diet, um, there's actually an overview of studies that I've linked to in the blog post that shows that cortisol levels are actually often elevated during a time period like this. And I've actually um, linked you guys as well to one, two, three, four, five, five other articles that discuss cortisol and how it relates to weight loss. And I highly recommend you guys um, do some research on that um, because it is very important and it really can have effect um, an effect on um, your ability to lose weight, even on HCG. Sometimes we experience stalls and things like that. And um, well, I don't really advocate getting too worried about stalls in general, because I do think they are a natural part of the process. Um, having your cortisol like way too off could definitely hamper your weight loss on HCG. So, so definitely check those articles out. So the, so the reason that cortisol can become elevated during a diet like this is because you're kind of doing something exciting, right? Um, that's probably not a very scientific explanation, but um, essentially that's what's going on, right? You're eating a very low calorie diet. You're forcing your body to use your fat stores for fuel. So instead of just having like readily available food that it can break down and just use the way it normally would, now it's having to find fat in your body and break that down and process it and use that for fuel. So it's just, it's different than what it's used to doing. It's, it's work, right? So this could be considered just a stressor that, you know, basically puts your adrenals, including your cortisol more on alert during a time like that. And that doesn't mean that it's bad. I mean, you know, the only a way to achieve great things in life is sometimes to do something that involves some form of stress, right? In fact, there's articles and studies that show that, that our bodies actually do need stress, a certain amount of it um, in order to flourish. Um, however, everything in balance, right? And we all know that too much stress is, is a very bad thing and causes stuff like heart attacks. <laughs> it can, can get really extreme. So it's, it's really about finding that balance. Now, I just wanna mention here, this is actually one of the reasons that I don't usually recommend that people do really long extended rounds of HCG. Um, the protocol was originally designed to be done in three to six weeks. And I know that some of you guys do successfully do it longer than that, but I do feel that it's um, a risk when you do that because when you stay on the diet for that extended a period of a time, um, I feel like you basically, you can tax your adrenals to the point where you actually experience adrenal fatigue and that can really be a bear to recover from and can take a while versus doing the protocol for just three to six weeks and then having you know, a good break I feel like that doesn't overly tax your body and allows your body to kind of come back into balance. If, if anything was getting off balance, it allows you to recover 
um, and then, you know, and then to do following around. So that's just a little bit of feedback there. I know some of you guys do it successfully and, and that's great. And it's just something to keep in mind though. Um, because you, you just, you want to think about the future. It can be hard to do that when we're on this protocol and we're trying to get to our goal. Um, but you want to think about how you're going to do in the long term. And um, adrenal fatigue is no joke. And I think a lot more people deal with that these days. I deal with it. I still, to this day, right now, I take a small amount of cortisol um, for my adrenals um, because, you know, I have other health conditions not related to HCG. Um, I have Lyme disease and Hashimoto's and thyroid stuff, so I, I take the cortisol and that really helps me. But when I don't have it, when I don't have enough cortisol in my body, I feel pretty horrendous and it's not something that heals very quickly. So the whole point of that was to say that if you have elevated cortisol while on the HCG diet, this can cause trouble sleeping because what happens is, is it's nighttime, you're supposed to have low cortisol so you can go to sleep, but instead your cortisol is elevated. And so that makes it hard to go to sleep because you're alert. So let's talk about the solution to this particular problem. So if you have elevated cortisol levels while you're on the diet, which as we've talked about could easily be a common result. So it, that could be very easily the reason for your issue. Um, there is actually a specific supplement. It's, it's a natural, natural supplement um, that works in, incredibly well for this specific problem. And I, it wor it's what worked for me. I didn't have trouble sleeping every round, but one round in particular, I really did. And, and just other times in life I've had this, this fixed it for me. And that's because that was the reason for my trouble sleeping. Now, the supplement is called, wait for it, <laughs> phosphatidylserine. Yes, I know you're not going to be able to figure out how to spell that um, just listening to how I say it. So you're going to need to go to the blog post and see it and then just click on the link to the supplement because it's also going to be hard to type <laughs> to type in. <laughs> um, but it's called phosphatidylserine. Don't be scared off by the name. <laughs> it works incredibly well. And this is what it does. The phosphatidylserine it actually basically will normalize your cortisol levels. So if your cortisol levels are actually too high or too low, it helps to normalize them. And I've actually linked you guys to a couple articles that discuss um, the mechanism behind how it's doing that, like how it's normalizing it. But what I would do is I would take some of the phosphatidylserine before I went to bed at night when I was on HCG and, and I was able to sleep. It, it, it just made a huge difference. So I highly recommend checking into that as one of your first lines of defense if, if it's very troublesome for you. Um, the other thing I want to mention, um, the product that I've, the products I've linked to in the blog post, they don't contain oil. And you want to be careful with that because some of the phosphatidylserine products come in an oil, like their little gel, they kind of look like little vitamin E caps. And normally that would be fine like off of HCG. It might even work better that way, I'm not sure. But you wouldn't want to take that on HCG because of the oil content. So make sure whatever phosphatidylserine you get that it, that it doesn't have uh, the oil in it, okay? Okay, so the second reason that people can have trouble sleeping on HCG is melatonin levels being all wacky. And that's something that people are more familiar with is hearing about melatonin. Um, to be honest, I actually don't know as much about this particular subject. I've never tried taking melatonin, and so, but we know that melatonin is, is kind of a part of your sleep cycle, right? And your, your, your body's natural clock, right? Um, for awake time and sleep time. So what I've done is I found a few articles for you guys to do a little more research on that. What's kind of interesting um, is that People do use melatonin to help them get to sleep and, and a lot of people feel that it works very well. And, and I believe in user feedback. Um, however, our bodies are not all the same, of course, right? And also dosage of a particular supplement can have an impact as well. Um, there is one interesting article though that I posted just so you guys can compare by Dr. Oz. And basically it's about how melatonin may not be the magic bullet for sleep. So it might be worth just reading that. Um, but then again, I found another article saying how melatonin really does help sleep. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, that's one of the things though that can be off that people do report that when they take the melatonin and that's the solution, right? So if, if your melatonin is off, that is the supplement type solution. Um, we'll talk about other tips and natural ways to, you know, try to address stuff like that um, soon, but um, that's the way to do it. Now, 
What I did find is that you may want to have kind of a lower dosing of the melatonin if you try it. And when I looked on Amazon, there was varying ones. Some had higher dosages in one tablet. So I linked you guys to a smaller uh, one milligram dosage tablet of melatonin for you guys to check out. But again, do a little more research on that um, because like I said, I don't have as much experience with that particular topic. I just tried to find some good articles for you to read up on that um, because that is definitely one of the possible causes for having trouble sleeping um, where that could possibly help. Let's talk about another reason for having trouble falling asleep, which is hunger. So we already talked about how being awake more hours of the day can cause hunger. Um, but also if your dosage of HCG is off, it can cause abnormal hunger anyway. The problem with being hungry, you guys know that when it's at nighttime and it's time to go to sleep and you're really hungry, it's very hard to go to sleep. And this can kind of snowball because you know, you can't go to sleep cause you're hungry. So then you end up not sleeping as much, which then makes you more hungry. Um, <laughs> so, and then there's like a vicious cycle going on, right? I've, I've linked you guys to my very, very extensive article now on HCG dosage. There, I have tons of information on how to try to dial in your proper dose. And now I've got lots of um, stories written in by real HCGers showing how they were able to make those adjustments in their dose, um, what, how they felt before, how they felt after, and that will kind of help you guys with that. Now, if the dosage of the HCG does not fix your hunger, and or you are forced to stay up more hours of the day than others because of your work schedule, maybe you're a nurse or something like that. Um, probably what I would advise in that case so that you can get to sleep when you need to is um, one of two things. Either save a small portion of your 500 calories to eat before bed, perhaps half a fruit, you know, like half an apple or a little bit of protein or something like that. So save part of your calories and have that as a, a bedtime snack. Or the other thing you could do is actually just add a little more calories. So add an extra serving of protein or some veggies, P2 veggies maybe, and have that as a bedtime snack or half, you know, maybe a couple strawberries or something like that. So you're not adding a lot of calories, maybe between, you know, 50 and 100 calories. Um, I guess actually on HCG that could be considered a lot. But if you, if you add that in so that you can go to sleep, that would be another way to do that. Because in the end, you guys remember, that's a little off protocol, right? My suggestion to add in a little more food <laughs> at night. Um, but in the end, you could be following the rules of the diet strictly, but if you're hardly getting any sleep every night, you're gonna end up facing poor results regardless, right? So that's why in this particular scenario, I feel like it would probably be a good idea to consider adding something in um, now, however, I do feel like it's a good idea to try to address the sleep issue with some of these other things that we're talking about first. You know, the phosphatidylserine for the cortisol levels or the melatonin, or we're actually gonna talk more now about caffeine and stuff like that. So you might wanna try all of those tips first, but it's kind of like, you know, if all else fails or you don't have time to try these other things, um, adding in a few more calories is not gonna ruin your results. Um, because remember how important sleep is to your weight loss efforts as well. So you've kind of got to weigh both of those things. All right, so let's talk about caffeine intake and how that can affect sleep. Now, I'm actually pretty sensitive to caffeine. I can't even drink one cup of black, I mean, I can't, I can't even drink one cup of coffee a day at all. Like I don't, I'm, I don't drink coffee. I've had probably two cups of coffee in my entire 30 some odd, you know, I'm in my mid thirties in all those years. I've only had a couple cups of coffee. So, um, which probably sounds crazy to you guys. And I love the smell of it. I wish I could have it. I must have a liver problem or something. Cause, um, even one cup makes me just feel like not motivated and energetic in a good way. It makes me feel like jittery and crummy. That's, that's the only result that I get from it. But I have found that two cups, of black tea is just the right amount of caffeine for me. It, it takes me from that place where like I wake up in the morning and I feel like I don't think I can accomplish anything ever again. <laughs> it takes me from that place to feeling kind of like, oh, okay, I think I could, I could do something today. I'm feeling a little better, feeling more motivated. Um, so, so there is a certain amount of caffeine that's right for me. Um, now I have discovered though that I cannot have any caffeine past about one or 2 p.m. If I do, I will not be able to sleep that night, 
which sounds crazy, even if it's a small amount, even decaf. For a while, I got in the habit of having like decaf black tea because it just, it has a little bit of that taste that the caffeine adds, you know, that's really good. And so I'd be having that throughout the day. And I immediately started having trouble, like fitful, fitful sleep. And I'm like, man, why can't I sleep well? You know, I usually sleep great. And I realized it was because of the decaf black tea. I mean, it's supposed to not have much in it, right? So, so that's another thing to consider if you're a major um, coffee drinker or caffeine person. It's not that it's bad to have caffeine, but I don't know, have you ever considered the timing of your caffeine and how much? Um, because that's the other thing I discovered too. I can have two cups of black tea in the morning, but I cannot have three. When I started having three, even though it was in the morning before 1 p.m., I would still have the same problem, sleeping issues, fitful sleep. So if you haven't experimented with that, it may be worth trying. Just not eliminating your coffee, of course, you could never do that, but have less than you usually do for a day or two and just see what happens. See if it, because if it's something you've never experimented with, it, that very well could be playing a role. For me, it was easy to discover because I'm not a big caffeine drinker and I only have a little bit. So when I add in a little more, it's, it's very obvious right away. And my body wouldn't adjust to it either because I would, I'd be doing that for like a week and I'd still be having fitful sleep for a whole week and, and I'd finally realize what was going on. So you may wanna check into that. Now this is just a silly little tip, but it makes a big difference for me. So I'm just throwing it out there because maybe it will help one of you. Um, I take a hot shower before bed every night. I didn't even realize that this was a habit that I had until fairly recently. I realized I can't really go to sleep unless I take a hot shower before bed. And the reason is because my feet are cold. <laughs> so if I get into bed and my feet are cold, it takes like two hours for me to fall asleep because I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable and I feel cold. And when I take a hot shower, I usually end up getting up. I'll lay awake tossing and turning in bed for an hour because I'm like, I don't feel like taking a shower. I'm just gonna go to bed. And I'll lay there for an hour, not able to go to sleep. So finally I'll get up and take a shower and then I'm able to go to sleep you know, in like five minutes. So something about the shower, I feel like it warms me up in my bones. And for some of you guys out there, I, a lot of you women deal with health problems like I do. So that's why I wanted to mention this. Some of you may already do this um, because when you deal with fibromyalgia, thyroid problems, Hashimoto's, adrenal fatigue, um, all of those different chronic illnesses, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, our bodies hurt. They feel brittle sometimes, they feel cold, and it's hard to warm up. And all of those things can affect our ability to sleep. And I've found that like sometimes I'll use a heater and that never does the same thing for me. Like it kind of makes me hot on the outside, but then still doesn't warm up my insides. So when I take a hot shower, I feel like it warms up my bones. And then when I get in bed, it's like, ah, off to la la land. So anyway, it's just, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about something that some of you might think is a little crazy, because I kind of thought it was a little crazy at first too. My husband was like, yeah, let's do this. And I was like, uh, sounds a little crazy. Turning off your power at night to your bedroom. Okay, so hear me out on this, all right? Once we started doing this, turning off the actual circuit breaker to our room, and I'll explain how we went about doing that in a second, when we turned off the circuit breaker so that there was no electricity near, near us when we were asleep, I started sleeping like a, a dead log, a real dead log off in some remote, deep, dark forest in Switzerland or something. Um, and I've always thought that I slept well. So for me to notice a significant, significant difference, I feel is, um, is kind of, is notable. So basically I felt like I was sleeping a lot more deeply and I'm assuming that by sleeping more deeply that the sleep is probably also a lot more restorative. So maybe my body is able to accomplish a lot more when it's like in that deep of a sleep. The reason that my husband and I have looked into doing this is because we've, you know, we both deal with chronic illness and uh, we were doing research on the negative effects of EMFs on health and stuff like that. Now, not everyone believes in this, but I personally do. <laughs> um, and so that's where the idea came from. What we did was we paid an electrician. Some of you guys may already have the right setup where you can just 
you know, shut off the breaker to your bedroom and, you know, maybe a couple surrounding rooms with no problem. We didn't have that. It was like our bedroom was also hooked up to our kitchen, which had our refrigerator. So we paid an electrician, like I think it was two or 300 bucks. It really wasn't actually too much. And he came and rerouted whatever needed to be rerouted so that our bedroom was on a separate circuit from the kitchen. And so, it, I mean, it, at first it sounded like a pain. Honestly, I was like, what a pain to have to go out. We had to go outside. You have to go outside and turn it off every night. What a big deal, you know? But actually it wasn't. It, it takes like 20 seconds every night. Basically the last person who goes to bed, um, we did have to get into the habit of turning off our computers um, because we actually turn off the power to our entire house except for the kitchen. But you don't have to do that. You could just do, you know, your room. But basically if, you, if your head is close to another room that has a lot of electrical stuff, you would want to consider turning off that room as well. But um, anyway, so yeah, just the last person to bed turns off their computer, goes outside, flips one, one or two switches and, and comes into bed. And it's, it's really not a big deal. We keep a couple flashlights around, you know, for a couple things, but we never hardly need them. And like I said, you know, our kitchen is still on. So it's like, you can turn a light on in there in the middle of the night if you need to. Um, but that made a huge difference in how I sleep. Now I want to mention one idea. If you guys decide to try this out, I had a very strange reaction when we first started doing this, I actually got very depressed for like two weeks straight. Um, and I stuck it out because I, in my mind, I thought, well, there's no way that turning off the elect electricity at night can be bad for my body. Like it can't be that the electricity is good for me, right? Like that just doesn't make sense. It's man-made, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I decided to stick it out and sure enough, after about two weeks, the depression lifted and I, and I felt fine. And I was also, of course, sleeping very well. So I started sleeping well right away. Um, but the depression that set in, it was all day, every day. And it was pretty severe. I, I mean, I kind of felt like, I don't think I can work anymore. Like, I don't think I can make another HCG video again. And I just don't see how I'm going to do this anymore. And it was horrible. And you know, I have no idea what the cause is. The only thing I can really think of is, is that my body was detoxing. It's like possibly if now my body's able to sleep a lot more deeply and it's more restorative, maybe it's all of a sudden doing more, which is releasing toxins into my bloodstream, making me feel depressed. That's kind of the only thing that I could think of. So I'll never know for sure, but I can tell you that it lifted. And I did want to mention it though, because it's, you know, possibly, if you're in the middle of an HCG round and you, you decide like, hey, I'm gonna turn off my circuit breakers and then you feel really depressed, obviously that's not a good recipe for being on the diet. You don't wanna be really depressed on the diet because it's not gonna work. So, um, so if that did happen and you felt depressed, maybe wait you know, until after your end of your round when you can you know, deal with feeling not so great for a couple weeks. So, um, but anyway, I, I really recommend trying this. Sounds crazy but don't knock until you try it. Okay, the last two tips are kind of just more like generic type ones you read online, but I'm just gonna mention them because people do say that it can make a big difference. Um, one is doing something active in the AM. So I actually don't usually exercise in the morning. Sometimes I do, but sometimes I don't. And I, like I said, I don't have trouble sleeping, so it, you know I don't worry about it. But it does say that if you do something active in the morning, that this, makes it easier to fall asleep at night apparently. So if you're exercising, maybe do it in the morning. Um, and then the last one was getting sunlight in the AM. And that's another thing that I probably don't do. I'm inside at my computer typing away in the morning a lot. So I should get outside more. But if you're having trouble sleeping, it's, they say that getting some sunlight um, through your eyelids um, in the morning can also, and I think that that's helping again with your, your melatonin levels and your whole sleep wake cycle. I think that's the point of that is to, to be normalizing that through nature. And if you can do it through nature instead of through a supplement, I mean, that, that is ideal, right? So, so that is worth giving a try as well. All right, that's it you guys. This was a long one, but you know, I had a lot of stuff that I wanted to share with you. And of course, you know, you don't, I'm assuming most of you don't watch the whole video of this probably, but I just make them in case, but there's the audio. You might be listening to this through the podcast. Um, and of course you can always read the article and all the links that we discussed will be in the article that goes with this. Um, but basically in a nutshell, remember these main things. Sleep is very important on any diet, 
but especially probably something like HCG because having restricted sleep has been proven to lead to more muscle loss and less fat loss. Um, additionally, it's important because not sleeping as much will change your hormone levels, making you feel hungrier. So it will lower your leptin levels, which leptin levels need to be high in order to not feel hungry. And it higher, it, it raises ghrelin levels, which ghrelin levels need to be low in order to not de be dealing with hunger, pain, you know, stomach growling stuff. So, so those were those important reasons there. Um, and then we talked about some of the main reasons for having cortisol problems and how to fix that. I think the main ones are the phosphatidylserine for the elevated cortisol, that can work. There's the melatonin, um, if, if your melatonin levels are wacky. Um, check the caffeine intake that you guys have, um, both the timing of it, like how late in the day you're having it, as well as how much. Even if it's only in the morning, how much are you having? maybe experiment with having less or earlier in the day or both. And also, of course, we talked about if you're hungry, you can't go to sleep because you're hungry, so check your HCG dosage. If that fails, you may need to incorporate a small amount of, of extra P2 food as a, as a bedtime snack so that you can get to sleep. Um, because otherwise, remember, you may be facing poor results anyway if, you're, if you don't make a modification, um, if you're having trouble sleeping. And then, you know, the other tips we talked about. So I hope you guys found that helpful. And you guys can find me on Facebook, um, on Instagram. I'm pretty much HCG Chica everywhere. So that's where you can find me. And don't forget, my workbook is now out, HCG Chica's HCG Diet Workbook. You can find it on Amazon.com. If you just search um, HCG Diet, HCG Chica, uh, the workbook will pop right up for you guys. And, um, and I'm very excited about its usefulness for you all. I put a lot of effort into it. Um, I, I crafted it. I crafted it. I, I like to use the word crafted because I did actually get a book that was kind of like a workbook. And I, it, when I looked into it, it had great information. Like I could tell it was good, but it was laid out. Like all the text was so small and it was so cramped and just visually, it was very hard to comprehend and digest and it overwhelmed me. And so I put it down because I just couldn't handle it. It was too overwhelming. So, um, so when I say I crafted the workbook, I very carefully laid out the information for everything, the diet instructions, the actually the daily tracking, the quick glance sheets, everything I tried to lay out in a very clear way so that your eye would easily understand how to use it and, and just, yeah, because I'm just such a visual person. So anyway, I hope that that helps you guys. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.